All right, so I meant for the answer to be no, but I accidentally messed up. I did on purpose put in parallel mark. If you don't know that those lines are parallel, then you cannot say, even though you have these right here, if you don't know that they're parallel, you can't say that's an isosceles trapezoid. What did I mess up on? Does anybody know what I messed up on that allows you to say that it is an isosceles trapezoid? What's the definition of a trapezoid? Anybody understand that? What has to be true? So let's say it was a different shape. What has to be true in that for it to be a trapezoid? Just one thing, if it's not isosceles. Just one thing has to be true. Well, four sides has to be true, but you see that. One thing that has to be true for it to be a trapezoid. One pair of opposite sides has to be parallel. So I didn't draw that in, but in order for it to be a trapezoid, that has to be true. Well, I told you it was a trapezoid, which means even though I didn't draw it in, because I told you, because I said, can you prove that the trapezoid, meaning that's a trapezoid, which means if it's a trapezoid, that has to be. So again, not something that'll ever bite you on one of my quizzes, but that's the kind of stuff on your EOC, your SAT, ACT, PSAT, a lot of those tests that you can get a, called a concordant score. It means it's a score that will qualify for your EOC score. A lot of those quizzes will have stuff like that on there where you have to really understand almost kind of like logic and proof stuff in the question. Anyway, so once you know that and then you know that you have two sides that are congruent, yes, you can now say it's isosceles. All I need is one additional piece of information. If I know I have two parallel sides, any one of these three things, so knowing that these are congruent or knowing that these are congruent or knowing that these are congruent. Any one of those three things is enough as long as I know I have two parallel sides. Uh, we did some problems if you weren't here. I don't think I even recorded that. So those are not recorded. So you need to know how to do those problems. I'll tell you which problems you need to know at the end of our lesson. Uh, what else do we do? Really, that was it. Just a couple problems. And then we talked about where the trapezoid. And really, just an I. Oh, so we said this is not an isosceles trapezoid. It's just a trapezoid. There's not much you can do with those. There's not a lot of math because no sides have to be congruent. Um, no angles have to be congruent. So there's really not a lot that you can do with a generic trapezoid. So just focus on this. I think all the, every single practice problem was on this. Not on, there's nothing I don't think on that. All right, any questions on that? All right, so look at your book pages. We are on. I don't remember. Today's your deadline, by the way, which pretty much already passed for you for taking that one quiz. So if you didn't take it, it's going in the books. And I don't think anybody from this class came and took it. Uh, all right, so turn. We're not going to do anything with the coordinate plane stuff. A lot of times, though, that always goes back to the distance formula. They're giving you a coordinate plane. The first thing you should think of is distance formula. That's the whole reason they give you the plane is so you have numbers that you can use to figure out distance. We're not going to do anything with that. Uh, so turn to the one that says mid segments of trapezoids on 50, page 50. This is the easy part of this lesson. So there is nobody that should struggle on this section of the quiz on Friday. I mean, I shouldn't say no, but well, I mean, there really is no. If you're in geometry, if you've made it this far and you're still in high school, even if you're bad at math, 
even if you just focus on this one thing, like if the other stuff is just so hard, you're like, I'm never going to get that. If you get this, you'll get a passing grade. What we're about to do for the first couple of problems. Um, but first, let's talk about what a mid segment of a trapezoid is. So if you want to kind of highlight that, I'm talking about the mid segment of a trapezoid. Doesn't have to be isosceles. Hopefully you can see this is not an isosceles triangle. Angles are not congruent. The length of that is not the same as the length of that. So it doesn't have to be isosceles. The mid segment of a trapezoid is the line that goes. So it's parallel to the other lines. So that's one thing. I didn't even mention that in the other classes. Parallel to the other lines. It is created using the midpoints of the leg. So if you remember the segments, I not on phone, the segments of the, the sides that are not parallel, those are called legs. The two parallel sides are the bases. So that's a base and that's a base. And again, all, all the bases have to be parallel or it's not a trapezoid. So the legs are the sides that are not parallel. So those are the legs. We did this last class, so I'm going fast. It's recorded. So if we take the midpoint of both legs, so Q is a midpoint. Q is the midpoint of KL. And P is the midpoint. I'm not really going like right along with the book, but I'm guessing most of this stuff is in here the same way. It's a pretty short lesson, so this is really all you need. P is the midpoint of JM. So if we find the midpoints of those two segments and we connect them, that is the mid segment. Makes sense? Two midpoints, it's a mid segment. It creates some congruent size, some congruent lengths. Those are congruent because again, P is the midpoint. So those little segments have to be congruent. If Q is the midpoint, those have to be congruent. Nothing to do with angles being. Well, actually, there are some angles that are congruent. The book doesn't mention this. These angles would be congruent here, like angles on the same side. Like that angle is congruent to that angle. It'd be a different angle. Book did not get into that, but just in case it pops up. So those angles, if I'm drawing a parallel line here and here, those would have to be the same measured. Some of this, I think a lot of you would just, you just like conclude that on your own, even if you didn't really know a theorem to support it. Wait, what did that mean? Uh, so here's the last, pretty much the last piece. So the length of the mid segment. There's a formula they give you over there. I'm going to give you a slightly different one. Base one. Um, I was going to write top base and bottom base when I did this before, but it's not necessarily the top and the bottom. I could turn that figure to where they'd be left and right. So I'm just going to write base one. It doesn't matter which one is base one or base two because you're adding them together anyway. So if you flip the order of them, they still just get added together in the one number. So it doesn't matter which one is base one, which one is base two. And then you divide that by two. That's the flow. And then that's equals the mid segment, length of the mid segment. And by base one and base two, I mean the length of those. So length and length. The length of base one plus the length of base two divided by two is the length of the mid segment. That's your formula. You're going to use that for every problem that has to do with the length of either the bases or the set mid segment, which we're going to do so in a minute. Uh, quick question. What is that formula really? I, 
what is this formula really just the same thing as? Formula you use all the time. Oh, I'm you to answer this question. But I'm going to give you a different question. I call a bunch on these. Lane, actually, I'm going to call him Lane. No, I have 100% confidence Lane is going to get this question correct. <laughs> Lane, you take a quiz in my class, and there's two grades on it. Which I do a lot, it's good in two grades. And you get a 100 on one grade and an 80 on one grade. What's your average? What you get? A 90, right? What'd you do? Uh, we add two numbers together and then divide by how many numbers there are. So there's two numbers and the half of 186. That's just the yeah, app. That's all. I'm not big on memorizing formulas, so try it. If you can make an association, all the mid segment is, is the average of the two bases, the average length between two numbers. So you would add those two numbers and divide by two, get the average. So if you can make that connection, it'll keep you from having to try to memorize yet another formula in math. So with that in mind, I want you to do four problems. Example, what are the examples? There. So do example, wait, where is this? Yeah, example three and then the check below that. And then example four and then the check below that. Make sure you're using the formula if you struggle. So I just said, hopefully you wrote that down. So example three and then the check problem right below it. And then example four and the check problem below that. Might have might be on the next page for the example for them. I don't have a calculator. I'll walk around with some calculators. There's some around that you can get on them. White white calculators, and some of you will definitely be taking a you'll see coming up. That one so I'll give you to do all four of those. I'll give you like. I'll give you seven minutes and then I'll check in if, you're, if I still got people working and maybe I'll extend it a little bit. Does anybody not have the page? This is on page. Page 51. Is that where the practice problem or the example about 51? But page 51 is where they start. And I think you might have to go to the next page to do example four. But everybody, does anybody not have pages? I was gonna say I'll leave it up on the screen, but if anybody has pages, I'm not worried about it. I don't know how to help them. Uh, let's see. So are we doing example three and four? And the check problems after the examples, correct? Oh, oh, they're actually testing. I think some of them are.
Uh, oh, that's not what that gets. I should have been this. Or you would have been doing this on here. Substitution is actually this one. I'll find the two of this picture. Is not like Scott, like the other piece. So they're giving you, you know, that you're not solving it. This is different than other So I want you to write in words, and I want you to write in your face. Sure. So make sure when you get example three and example four are not done the same way. You're doing the exact same thing. Yes. Um, if you are doing them the same way, then you're doing the wrong thing. No man left. Um, raise your hand if you're done. I'll probably, if you're not done, that's fine. Um, I'll show you my guess is you might be struggling a little bit if you're not done, so I'll still just show you guys how to wrap it up. That's true.
Alright, um, so on a, well, not really a scale, like just really quickly. If you think that you were good on that, a piece cake, I want a thumbs up. If you think that you're got maybe parts of it sideways and then you like struggled and you still don't have anything down, thumbs down. So I'm going to give you one quick lesson. I think we're mostly OK. Maybe not all great, but hopefully when I go through it, that'll wrap it up. So again, first thing, I don't like formulas. I just want to know a mid segment is like the average of the two bases. It's average. So I know how to do the average. I add two numbers together and I divide by, like Lane said, technically it's by how many numbers. But in this case, I just have two bases, so it'll always be by two. So if I want to know what is the, um, we're finding the mid segment U R, I say okay, well U R is just the average of the two bases. That's one of the bases. Hold that thought. Oh wait, shoot. Did not need to do that. So that's one of the bases. That's one of the bases. I want the average between those. Two. Well, the average between those two is base one. I'm not going to write the formula, but it's base one plus base two divided by two equals the midpoint. So if you do the math on that, 14, 14, 14. 14 and a half. Good. And that one I expect it to be one of the easier ones. Same exact concept in the second problem. Almost put it in the same spot. Ah, ah. Close enough. So again, if I am trying to find the mid segment, so it's kind of like the mid segment is the variable. It's the unknown. So the mid segment will use y is equal to. So I'm going to just put a little y right there. 23 plus 16 divided by 2. So do the math. What'd you get? 19 and a half. That I think most people are probably OK with it's the next one that people started to struggle a little bit on. Oh, so you didn't hear the answer 19 and a half. Any questions on that? I just skip to the one that I think is a little tricky. So that's your easy type question on the quiz. Like the easiest thing you'll see on the quiz is what we just did. I don't, there will not be anything that could be easier than that. I hope. I hope that's not everything. Now we get to one that's a little trickier, and a lot of people want to just do the same exact thing they did in that last problem. You cannot do the same thing. It's a different type of problem. So again, formula base one plus base two divided by two is the mid segment. That's the formula. They gave you different information here. You cannot do the same thing. I have base one as a variable. So I need to say X plus, I should have asked you guys to do this, 16.7. Well, that's the trick. Is you're given different information, but the formula doesn't change. You can't try to force numbers into those two spots in your bases. I don't know what the base is. I don't know. That's an X. It's a variable. So I have to put a variable there. Now the rest of the formula is the same. Only difference is I do know the midpoint. 24 is representing this middle line. That's another thing people are still struggling with is to know where the information is referring to in the picture. If it's inside the picture, it's about something inside the figure. If it's got a little degree symbol, it's about the angle inside the so now to solve this, I'm going to do it a little bit of a different way than probably what most of you did, which is fine. I don't care how you do it. So that's our problem. Yeah.
Oh, it's not anymore. Oh, let's see. Oh, no wrong. I don't know at all. We wouldn't. Oh, good. So if that's our problem, the way you would normally get rid of it is you have to know why if I'm dividing by two, I need to multiply by two first. A lot of people either struggle with knowing the order to get rid of things or more so if that's a variable or even in a, like if the X plus 16.7 was on the bottom, then people really struggle with it because uh, you'd have to like multiply times X plus 27 or 16.7, then do that on the other side. That really throws people off. This method will work anytime you have kind of a fraction on one side and not a fraction on the other side. Doesn't matter if X is on the bottom or top. How do we change a number into a fraction? It's just one number, just a, there's no fraction. Oh, come on, we did this when we graphed, I believe, on the slope. How do you change something into a number to make it a fraction, but still be worth the same value? Like I want to make 24 a fraction, what do I do? Somebody, point, somebody's motioning it and somebody I think said it. I make this a fraction by putting it over one. Any number, even a decimal, technically, you could at least set it up. It wouldn't really be a fraction, but. So now I have a fraction on the left and a fraction on the right. That's a proportion. So if you remember back, remember back to your algebra days, we can solve a proportion by cross multiplying or sometimes you kids like to call it the butterfly. Sometimes you call the wrong thing the butterfly. I this would be the best. I'm taking the two diagonal numbers or two diagonal terms, I should say, and multiplying. So X plus 16.7 times one is just X plus 16.7. That equals, so then I set them equals, that's the key, 2 times 24. It's the same thing you would have gotten if you did it the other way. Um, it just makes it easier if this were, if this fraction were flipped upside down and X plus 16.7 was in the bottom, it'd be a lot easier to do it this way. What'd you get? No, uh, I didn't know. So now to finish it off, you should all know how to finish it off. Well, I would get what? 31.3 is what you should have gotten. Any questions? So when you did the check problem, it was the same exact thing. They gave you information for the mid segment, so you had to plug in this number, not both of those numbers. And then the math would be the same concept. Um, change it into a fraction like I did, then you can cross multiply. If you just know how to solve for the variable, then you can solve for it. What was the answer for the check? I just have the answer. This this check, check, oh, you got 11.8. I think I remember seeing that. So if you want to write, if you didn't do it, you can write the answer is 11.8 and come back and try that one. I'm not going to go through and solve that one too. Uh, I will, sh here I'll show it real quick, just in case anybody doesn't have pages that's watching the video. Next page apparently. Normal. There. Ah. Uh, so there's the check problem. If you're watching the video and you don't have your pages, you can try to do that check problem right there. We're not going to do anything with the coordinate plane. I will just briefly mention, because again, this is the kind of stuff you'll see on the district's tests, the EOCs, the SATs, the ACTs. If they're giving you a coordinate plane, all you're going to be doing is some kind of formula with the um, X's and Y's, typically, not always, but typically it's going to involve the distance formula because you're going to have to kind of know 
what is the length of a, a, one of the sides or maybe multiple sides of the figure. It's pretty time consuming. And if I like, I like giving you the shorter quizzes with not a lot of problems. And I don't want you to have to take an hour to, to solve out one or you know six problems. So I'm not going to mess around with it. And it's a similar concept to what we've done before with the coordinate plane. We had time, I'll do it. So now we're just going to move into the next um, lesson slash example. So we're going to learn about a figure called a kite. You remember the old fashioned like standard kite. That's where it gets its name from. You know, the kites that you fly that are very generic looking it is called a kite. That's what that shape is called. And that's why the kite is called a kite. So it is a four sided figure. You need to know the diagonals are perpendicular. And you need to know it has. It says exactly one pair of opposite angles. Um, I would still say a kite could could have both pair. I'm going to look that up for you because there was something they sent out from the district as to how we're going to use the definition. So for now, we're going to go with exactly one pair. I would say if if these angles were also congruent, which are clearly not 171 and 152, I would say that's still a kite. We learned it as a different figure. Um, does anybody know what figure we learned it as? What shape did we do that if if these angles were also congruent, it would be that shape? The wrong, it's good. Yeah, rhombus to me is still a kite. Somebody get back right back in. Yeah, it would be a rhombus because if you shorten, basically you'd be bringing this angle in because you'd have to widen it, which means you got to shorten these lines. The only way for you to have those angles be congruent is if these two sides were the same length as those two sides up there, which makes it a rhombus. Uh, so, but for now, we're going to stick with just one pair of congruent sides or congruent angles. I'm sorry. Uh, you do need to know that these two sides are congruent and these two are congruent. So there are matching congruent sides. Pull. Oh. And oh, and then the diagonals are perpendicular, which we'll get to in the next example, not this one. So here's what I want you to do. Solve for n. So this is the first example. Well, it's example six, but first example for kites. Solve for n. We've done this before. We've done this actually many times before. We did it with trapezoids. We did it, I think, for a rhombus. And probably for another one of the parallelograms. Yeah, we did. We did it for another parallel. I want you to solve for n. I'll give, start giving you hints in like 30 seconds. You're not sure where to get started. Chandler, I want you working on this one. I want everybody to work on Emory, it's Anthony. We only have less than three weeks left. And like I said, today is about to go in the books for one of those quizzes. What's the one? Parallelogram? No, the circumcenter, in center, 21st century. Okay. 21st of last month. That's February 21st is the deadline. You know, with what could be stuff at the two, two weeks ago. Well, I, I had it graded in the book two weeks ago. That's how I came up with the deadline. Deadline is two weeks from. I mean, you would have taken it by now. Okay, what other parallelograms? Because I need to retake that. Uh, parallelogram. But I stayed in the right there. I think you to come in for two there for that building as well. Uh, tomorrow should be good. Okay. You do add, like any after school to it? I have flag football every single day. I don't think that's home. No way. No, not right now. You need to see me solve this. No, I'm just kidding. Did you get it? If you did it, you got it right. I'll let you go. Yeah. So your first hint is that's a four sided figure. How many total degrees in a four sided figure? 
So you should just kind of know that by now any four sided figure is 360 degrees. There's percent. From there, hopefully you can figure it out, but I'll give you another minute. And they got that early. First game is until three. Yeah. That's like the Yeah, the varsity girls were playing. I don't know, Dad. It's it's like an exhibition, but there's also a tournament. But I don't think we're in the tournament. We're in the exhibition or something. I don't know. I'm confused. I thought we were just in a tournament, but then the varsity coaches send something out saying we were just exhibition. Coach Shannon, well, he's got a buddy that helps him, but the true official coach is Coach Shannon. I used to help with both, but um now since i'm the only person to like coach shanahan will come over every once in a while for jv but it's pretty much just me and we have more girls so it's there's no time for me to help with our city i thought you were going to say oh that's it uh so if we know that in a three or in a four-sided figure there's 360 degrees i'm going to give you the most intuitive way to write an equation for it what's true about n and l yeah, they have to be the same number, correct? So if I don't know what that number is, I could still write something in like that, like some variable. It's got to be the same number. So my equation from there, that again is the more intuitive equation, but if you took a shortcut to this, I'm sure most of you did take a shortcut. That's fine. But that is truly the equation right there. Now, if you didn't write that and you have like what I'm going to write for the next step, that's fine. So if you combine like terms, you would say that's 2y. I guess I can write here. I'm not going to write the degree symbols anymore. 123. So you get to that point right there. Now, a lot of you just said, well, I know I need to subtract 123 out of that 360 which would be what you would do if you solved that. Your first step would have been to subtract 123 on both sides. So if you just showed me this, that would be fine. So 237, then you should know again, we would have 2y equals 237, so we would divide by two. So if you showed me that, 118.5, that is one of the two angles. Well, it's, bo it's both angles, they're both 118.5. I still consider that to be a pretty easy problem. So far, I haven't really given you anything difficult that's on here, and I'm, we're not going to do anything difficult. There are problems in the um, book that are get passed. Do you have a chance to look something over? Yeah. I watched the video. What's your sixth period? Huh? Oh, yeah. Up there. Did you tell her how you unprepared you were and that's why you had to do this? No, you were so not prepared. Give me a break. Uh, all right, so that's an example of an easy question about now. There's other stuff I could do because if you notice, there's congruent symbols there. I could do something with the length of sides. There's congruent symbols there. I could do something with those. I could just put equations in here, and you'd have to know that those are congruent, so you'd set them equal to each other. So there's a lot of other stuff that can be done. So I'm just giving you an easy one, with an example of an easy problem, but just understand you need to practice some of the book problems to try some of the more difficult ones. Uh, I don't even know if, oh yeah, there is one more problem. So go to the next page. And this one's again, a relatively quick one. So when you have a kite and you draw in the diagonals, some congruence happens. Some congruence is part of a kite.
So we now have created a bisector. And one of the, not both of the diagonals, so don't get it confused with a rhombus, which splits both diagonals in half. There's two bisectors in a rhombus. We split one of the diagonals in half. So one diagonal is split in half, one is not. So one diagonal is a bisector. BD is a bisector. Not only does it split the diagonals in half, it also splits the angles in half. So those angles are also congruent, which it doesn't mention in the theorems. That is something you need to know. And then the last thing is the diagonals are perpendicular. So it creates four right angles. So there's a lot of stuff that they could do on a district test. I'm not going to get super complex, but I could do stuff with right triangles, congruent triangles, all kind of things in there. Because they share a side, so it'd be pretty easy to make you try to prove something. If we know one angle is congruent, because it's 90, I know they share that side, so that's congruent. Um, I know these are congruent up here. So there's all kind of stuff they could do with congruence. We've kind of done congruence and triangles, so I'm not going to repeat all of it, but I would be shocked if there wasn't some of that on the either the, the final, the EOC, or maybe if we have to give you another district test, which I don't, they haven't told us if we have to or not yet. Uh, let's see. And again, I, now I could give you, again, something about these being congruent or these being congruent. Um, these big angles are congruent. The little ones are not. So these are not congruent to each other here. Don't think this is bisected because it's not. So here's the main thing you need to figure out on your own if I give you a type. And it won't look like that. It'll look more like this. Ah, I missed it. Man, that's horrible. Hold on, sorry. I don't like it. So if I tell you this is true, you have to know where the by only one diagonal will be a bisector in that. You have to know where the diagonal would be the bisector. So how would you tell? This one's easy to tell. Because clearly this isn't bisected. So I know that, that the bisector can't be this one because it doesn't split that into two equal halves. How would you know where the bisector is in that? Well, you need to come up with this on your own or when we talk about it, you need to make sure you make some kind of connection with it. Because I'm just telling you this is going to be how I give you the more difficult question on the quiz. It's going to come from this concept. What is it if it wasn't super obvious to tell, which it won't be, what is it that allows you to tell where the, the, di the diagonal that's a bisector, which one? Oh, here, there it is. I'm going to just draw two in. One of them's a bisector, one of them's not. Oh, boy, that's one. Oh, is it much better? Wow, so one of those is, one of them is not. Man, I just erased exactly what I drew. All right. Which one's the bisector? Blue or green? Why? What do you mean? Because the people can see it as I see it. So, how? I don't know how to explain it, but you can just see somebody it. explain laying off film. So somebody explain in another way that you would be correct. It is the blue one, but I want to come up with a more definitive one for everyone. Yeah, it's kind of a reflection, right? Or here's what I would say. The bisector splits congruent sides. So just pick two sides that are congruent and the bisector is going to split. You don't even have to like think of all the sides together. Just pick any two of congruent. Pick these. Well, it's going to split those. Or pick these. It's going to split those. 
So that's what I would use. So again, the bisector will be the diagonal that splits the congruent sides. And from there, if you understand that, whatever I give you in the figure about, like I might put, you know, equations in all four segments. So there might be an equation here, equation here, equation here, and then equation here. And I would say solve for X. You have to know which two you need to set equal to each other. And therefore, you'd have to know which one is the bisector. So if this is the bisector, then it splits the green lines into two. So you would say X plus four equals two X subtracted. So that's a pretty good example of what I'll probably do. I will look at the book problems as well. And if I like one of those more, then I might change it. So as long as you practice the book problems, you should be in pretty good shape. But that's just right off the top of my head. That's an example I could see me doing. Um, so again, it created two equal segments there. The angles are equal to each other down here. Those angles are congruent. The six and the 24 have nothing to do with each other. A district test, though, I would not be shocked at all if they say that. And they make you solve for that. A squared, B squared, C squared. So you'd have to know that these are perpendicular and that you can use a squared, b squared, c squared. All right, so here are your problems to do. This is what you're responsible for on the quiz on Friday, Thursday for you. We've already done one through three. So that was last class. If you weren't here, you need to do those on a trapezoid. So we're adding six through 10. That's the mid segment of a trapezoid, and they're pretty easy. Uh, 13 and 14, and then 17 and through 20 would be like, that's the most difficult thing you'll see, Some, something similar to that on the 17 through 20 are the toughest, along with what I just showed you about a kite a second ago. So you got, 35 minutes to practice today. Uh, there won't be a lot of practice time the day of the quiz, but I will probably give you a little more than normal. So I'll do some super fast lesson, just introducing something. And then I'll probably give you about 30 minutes to practice trapezoids and kites. So more than normal, but not like a whole class of practice. And then you'll do the quiz on Thursday of this week instead of waiting to. Let me do attendance and then I'll walk around and help. And now you can go ahead and do it. Who is it? Meineke? How do you not know your teacher's name? How do you not know how to pronounce your teacher's name? I hope he never watches this video because he's going to hear that. <laughs> 